In this video, I'm talking to Doug Rosendahl again, and our topic today is loss of engine power. Hello, Doug. Hi, Martin. That's a scenario lots of people are scared of, and there's a lot of information floating around of what one should do, what one shouldn't do, and I thought it would be a good idea to have a conversation trying to make sense of what, what to expect and, and what a good response is and what kind of decisions we have to make should that happen to us. So, you know, loss of engine power in an airplane, single or twin, is a risk. And uh, in my world, step one of mitigating risk is to acknowledge the risk. Okay? I believe if we're going to fly single engine airplanes, which I do quite a bit, we have to acknowledge the fact that sooner or later the machine was built by man and it's fallible and it's going to fail. And uh, I've had a couple experiences with that in my career, several actually. And so if we acknowledge that risk, it's only through acknowledging that risk that then we can go on to the next stage in the risk mitigation process, which is to rate the risk, rate the reward. If the reward doesn't outweigh the risk, then we should stop. Uh, if the re reward outweighs the risk, which in many cases I believe it does, I'm willing to accept the risk of an engine failure, then we should talk about mitigating strategies. Mm -hmm. And if experienced professional pal pilots such as you and I spend some time talking about the risk and the ways to mitigate the risk of an engine failure, I think we can dramatically improve the odds of a positive outcome if that happens. And so, you know, I think that's what we're here to discuss. You mentioned risk and reward and, and the, the risk, there are different methodologies to, to identify, to quantify risk. And uh, for our purposes, I think it has a lot to do with the phases of flight because engine failure uh, right after takeoff, right over a densely populated area, would be a different risk than engine failure at cruise altitude with a couple of airports in gliding distance. So what methodology do you use to, to make sense of that? So, well, another risk formula that I use is that total risk equals likelihood of occurrence times severity of consequences times time exposed. Okay, so if you talk about an engine failure after takeoff, first of all, the likelihood of that happening are, is pretty low. Mm -hmm. this, uh, the severity of consequences of an engine failure after takeoff in a densely populated area can be very high. But the time exposed is very low. So we've got low likelihood of occurrence, low time exposed, high severity of, of uh, consequences. We accept that risk. I do that regularly. But we still have this responsibility to go back to the other formula and figure out how we can mitigate that. So in the after takeoff phase, for years and years and years, that was, I mean, it's like t single versus twin, trike versus tail dragger, high wing versus low wing. It's a never ending discussion in aviation. Uh, land straight ahead or turn back. Um, there's no one answer to that question. You know, a lot of people talk about the impossible turn. It's not impossible. Let's acknowledge that. There are times when it is possible. There are, the, the real question is just because it's possible does not mean it's the lowest risk uh, alternative. So that's a long discussion to be had. Uh -huh. There are a lot of videos floating around on the internet um, that show people leisurely turning back to a landing from a uh, engine failure after takeoff um, in a Cub or a 172 that I believe set an incredibly unrealistic expectation and fail to consider some very, very uh, important um, qualifiers in that process. The first thing is idle thrust is not power off. Uh, I've many times gone up in a 172, and typically a 172 with a couple people in it at 
medium uh, density altitude, if you pull the throttle, it's going to come down somewhere between five and 600 feet per minute um, in, a, in a 45 degree bank turn. If you pull the mixture, that five to 600 feet will immediately go to seven to maybe even 900 feet per minute, depending on the propeller. That's gonna have a dramatic impact on the amount of altitude that it takes to execute a turn back. Yes. And, and people fail to acknowledge that. Um, you know, the new method of when I learned slow flight meant the stall horn was blaring continuously and you could feel the aerodynamic buffet just right in the nibble through the entire s slow flight demonstration. And if both of those criteria weren't met, your instructor was admonishing you to slow down. Today, we teach students to recover at the first indication of a stall, which is very often the stall horn. Mm -hmm. And many, many training airplanes, the stall horn comes on in excess of 10 miles an hour above when the first uh, aerodynamic indication of stall occurs. So we're not teaching students to fly the airplane at what we used to call the ragged edge of a stall. We're teaching them to fly the airplane significantly above that airspeed. And that extra 10 miles an hour of speed is going to radically increase the amount of area that it takes to do that. And to be able to fly an airplane in that regime right on the, the bitter edge of a stall requires a tremendous amount of finesse. And if you're off the end of a runway in a metropolitan area and the engine quits graveyard dead, the first thing that's going to happen is the pilot's going to take a huge shot of adrenaline. And all that finesse is out the window. All the finesse is gone. Your vision goes from 180 degrees of situational awareness to two inches at 2,000 yards. You are looking through a straw. Your fine motor skills are gone. And if you, and there's the startle factor, and then there's the time that it takes to respond to that, that is different for different people. And granted, you can reduce that starter, that startle effect by regular practice. Right. And some would propose that we should teach um, turnbacks, teach these turnbacks. And if anybody expects to use a low altitude turnback in their bag of tricks, then they absolutely should have extensive training and regular practice at that. But the problem is, if you do it at 5,000 feet over the airport and it's briefed, you, you've lost that startle effect. You do, you're not experiencing the, uh, the adrenaline rush, which takes away your situational awareness and takes away your fine motor skills. So it's not realistic. The other thing, at altitude, it's basically an instrument maneuver. Okay, because we're simulating the ground so we don't see it. So we've taken away ground rush. You don't feel the ground coming up to meet you. You know, the downwind turn, uh, another great aviation myth. Uh, the airplane does not know that it's turning downwind, but the pilot certainly does if you're close to the ground because it becomes a ground reference maneuver. And so as you're turning back, if you took off into a headwind and you're turning back, the tailwind is starting to push you you perceive acceleration and you need turn performance and so you will instinctively add back stick, right? Mm -hmm. And as you add that back stick, um, you're losing airspeed. And oh, by the way, if you're looking over your shoulder back at the airport property, once you turn your head like this, the ball that's in your ears doesn't work anymore. Okay, and so you're going to feel a strong desire to get the airplane pointed back at the airport. And what are you going to do to cause that airplane to increase its turn rate? Pull back. Pull back and? Uh, push the rudder. Push in, the rudder. To the inside. And when you push the rudder, what happens to the ball? Uh, you get into a skidding turn. That's correct. Yeah. And so then when the airplane does has, uh, unhook or stall, you know, it's game Spin, over. Yeah. So, I don't think we're um, 
adequate, adequately uh, exposing students to all the parameters that are involved in that maneuver. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a way to safely simulate it close to the ground. I know you, you cannot safely simulate it close to the ground because there will be inadvertent stalls and will kill more people. And I don't, I don't necessarily um, believe that the training we do at 5,000 feet above the airport at idle thrust with two people in a 172 has anything in common with a uh, A36 Bonanza like you fly um, with a constant speed propeller. I believe the risk of that maneuver is incredibly high. Conversely, everybody says, well, what if there's no other alternative? Well, that depends on what another alternative is. You know, we've all seen uh, examples of airplanes that landed in the trees and everybody walked away. Trees, a good dense tree canopy is, uh, yes, it's going to tear up your airplane, but it, it's a very survivable accident. Because at the end of the day, our objective is to sacrifice the airplane to save our lives. Maybe not save a broken leg or a bloody nose, but certainly save our lives. So I think you need to look at the whole risk picture in that thing. And I think if you do a, an honest risk analysis, a low altitude turn back is, is uh, almost always a bad idea. Now, a different scenario, and one of the scenarios that you know is you're flying a turbine airplane that goes up at 3,500 feet a minute and comes down at 1,500 feet a minute. Uh, entirely different subject. And, uh, you know, some airplanes you can turn around at the top of climb, turn around and go back to the airport you took off from and land because they have incredible climb performance. But even in those airplanes at very low altitudes where it's going to require perfect performance to execute the maneuver, I think the risk outweighs the reward. And then in many cases, an off airport landing into the wind. What I teach is aircraft that arrive at the earth with the wings level under control have survivors on board. Mm -hmm. And as we turn back and we experience that, if we go from a Cessna 172, where we can stall it in at 50 knots with a 10 knot headwind that gets it down to 40 knots. And if we turn back to the airport and we spin it in, we're dead. And if we are unable to make the turn and half at the last minute have to roll wings level and accept a downwind off airport landing, we went from a 50 knot landing to a 60 knot landing. And as you accelerate, it's harder to pick the spot. What's really important is that you can put the airplane on a spot of your choosing. Because if you can put the airplane on a spot and slide 100 feet before you hit something hard, you're probably going to survive. You can dissipate all that energy. Exactly. Yeah. But yet, if we turn back, we're going to be going 40 to 60 is a 50% increase in speed, which probably triples the energy of the accident. Mm -hmm. And we reduce the likelihood that we're going to touch down exactly on the spot that we want to, because it's harder because you're going faster. I like how you, how you mentioned that it depends on a lot of parameters that cannot always be accurately simulated, but some of those parameters um, could make the turn back uh, an, an easy choice. Right? If you have a, a very long runway, say a Cessna 172 lightweight, a little bit of headwind, by the time we have no more landable runway in front of us, we might be high enough to Absolutely. Uh, to return to landing, so it's 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 not always a bad choice, but uh, no, it's it, not. But I think of that as turning around and flying back to the airport and landing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, if if you're for, that decision for me is I when if I'm going to turn back to the airport, I want enough altitude that I can turn around and look at what I've got and say, uh oh, this isn't going to work and turn back into the wind and make an off airport landing into the wind. Right. Okay, that's what's crit What's really important is that when we arrive at the earth, we have the wings level under control at minimum speed. Yes. That means into the wind. So yes, if, you're, if you've gone up in your airplane with a normal load at the density altitudes that you normally operate at and pulled the mixture and executed a 360 degree turn 
and are willing to add some margin in the neighborhood of 25 to 50 percent to that, that's not a turn back after takeoff. That's turning around and flying back to the airport, which is an entirely different scenario. And, and now we're talking, we're basically talking about the en route engine failure. It's, you know, we're in the transition, but it's more like an en route engine failure. And that's an area where there's lots of room because still we have low uh, likelihood of occurrence. We have the possibility of high severity of consequences, but lower severity of consequences than an engine failure after takeoff in a metropolitan area. Right. Okay. But the time exposed is high because we spend most of our time going places at altitude. So I, the risk there might even be equivalent to the risk that, of, of having something happen. Now, fortunately, we've got more options. So how that turns out, you know, may be a better, a better outcome. And but, so, what? But there sure are examples of engine failures in those cases that don't end well. That so don't end we, well. We shouldn't That's take right. that for granted. And I think there's a huge opportunity. And I think if we're going to spend time um, working on a skill that we could use to mitigate the risk of an engine failure, that's where our focus should be because of the amount of time that we're exposed to an engine failure in the cruise phase mm -hmm. and the fact that we can absolutely very safely practice and learn the skills that it takes to make that work out. Yes. And that's a, in some ways they're similar skills, but uh, there's a lot more to it. You know, GPS has changed everything, right? I mean, switch tanks, you know, direct nearest enter. It's all, it's a game changer. And, uh, you know, in the old days, if you were in unfamiliar territory and you had an engine failure en route, there could have been an airport easily within gliding distance and there's very high probability that you might, if you weren't really doing your work in your cross country phase, you might not find it. Oh, yeah. And now we have, you know, direct nearest enter and you can put uh, parameters in for what you find to be an acceptable runway but I like to keep those pretty low because landing in an unsuitable runway and going off the end is far superior to landing in an unsuitable off airport scenario. Any flat surface will be suitable. Any flat surface will suit, is suitable, that's right. But so another good reason to get a commercial rating is the power off 180. Okay, the power off 180 says, I have the ability to put the airplane on a spot of my choosing on speed. And as we said previously, if you can touch down and slide for just a few hundred feet before you hit something immovable, you're probably going to survive if you're in a light GA airplane. Uh, if you're in a, you know, a tur single engine turbine, you need more room, but they're more robust airplanes too. So practicing, getting your commercial maneuver, or if you have a commercial maneuver, uh, practicing power off 180s in different configurations because it's going to be different every day. So one day do it with flaps approach. Another day do it from the very, from the 180, do the whole thing with flaps 180 because it's about that ability to sense your energy state relative to a point on the surface. So energy state is what? Altitude and speed. Altitude and speed, okay. And uh, we vary our rate of turn to, if, we, if we're high on energy, we reduce our uh, rate of turn. And if we're low on energy, we increase our rate of turn to shorten up the distance to the spot. But if all pilots would just practice, they're coming home to the home drone and just pull the mixture to idle and execute a 180. And when you can do those maneuvers reliably, you have dramatically increase the likelihood of a, uh, a survivable outcome in an off airport landing. Because the truth is you have a lot of control over that glide, but if you never practice it, you don't know how to interpret the cues uh, that you get from looking outside. You've heard me say many times before that as pilots, we don't rise to the occasion. We sink to the level of our most recent recurrent training. And so, uh, you know, it's a matter of personal pride for me. Uh, coming home is just 
you know, pull the power, execute the 180, and I want to touch down in the paint without yep. going short. And, uh, and, and in a perfect world, I want that to be on speed. But it's better to touch down and get on the binders, you know, just if you can put the airplane on the spot at a reasonable speed, even if it's a little bit fast, because a little bit fast touchdown is better than a little bit slow hitting the ditch prior to the field that you want to go into. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, thing that the military uses is called the simulated flame out approach. It's an SFO approach. And, and they do the same thing. And it, it starts at what's called the high key. And the high key is a point above the spot of intended landing, a certain altitude. And uh, in the P-51 Mustang, that's 3,000 feet. Okay? In an F-16, my understanding is it's 10,000 feet. And, and they train for that maneuver because if I hit that spot, I've practiced this 360 degree power off turn to a touchdown on the pavement. So I'm all jumped up out here. I've had an engine failure and I come in. If I make the high key, if I'm at or slightly above that altitude when I get to that point, I can exhale. I've got the airport made. I've done this before. All I have to do is execute a 360 and I'm going to be on the runway. Well, the power off 180 is just the last half of that turn. Okay, so to, to determine what the high key of your airplane is, we need to go out and uh, one way to do it is just to go up over the airport at 5,000 feet and pull the mixture and execute a 360 and add 250, 300 feet to that. Okay, there are ways to simulate that. Typically the high key is executed with the gear down because if you change configuration as we're coming around that turn, that changes our, our energy equation. And so it's easier if it's consistent. Now, if you aren't going to make the high key at the prescribed altitude, then leave the gear up. Sure. Because a gear up landing on the runway is far superior to a gear down landing off airport, right? Or if we don't make it around the last corner and we land here on the base turn, we come up short and land on the base turn. So. If you don't have the prescribed altitude, don't put the gear down till the. But if you're at the prescribed altitude, the runway's made, right? Yes. Put the gear down. Now we don't have to worry about it anymore. Maybe even some airplanes, the configuration would be gear down, flaps approach. It all depends on your airplane. I would argue in most light G airplanes, that'd be the correct. That would be the correct configuration for the high, the simulated flame out approach, would be at the high key, gear down, flaps approach, execute the 360. And the key is you've, you've done it before in that configuration. You know exactly how much altitude it takes. Uh, that brings nothing, confidence. Bring confidence. You're, you're in known territory then. Exactly. And the higher the confidence level is, the higher the likelihood of a positive outcome. Right. So I think that's where we ought to focus. Another place we ought to focus is, you know, pilots should all have committed to memory a uh, engine failure checklist. So mine comes because of the kind of airplanes I fly from an old World War II uh, checklist, which was called uh, Glide Gear Gas Ignition Heat Mixture Prop Canopy Harness. Okay, so glide, get the nose down, or if you're going really fast, pull the stick back there. and recapture that energy. Glide. Gear, up or down, well, it's going to start with the gear up. Gas, usually when the engine quits, it's related to fuel. Switch tanks, turn on the boost pump. Glide, gear, gas, ignition. Left, right, both, try off. It might be that the switch has failed internally and turning it off. Might be, it might run. Mm -hmm. Glide, gear, gas, ignition, heat, carburetor heat or alternate air. Mixture prop, okay, so the mixture. If... Uh, it could be that your engine's flooded and pulling the carburetor to idle cutoff, it burns the fuel out and you find that it Maybe starts. Yeah. If that happens, now you become the carburetor or the fuel injector and you can crack the mixture and for a known manifold pressure, you might be able to regulate the fuel flow and limp to, an, to the high key, pull the mixture and do your 360 and land. And I know a pilot that actually did that. He regulated the fuel flow with the mixture idle cutoff plates 
and, got, and kept the engine running until they got to a, a high key, executed a 360. So glide gas gear, glide gear gas, mixture prop, ignition, heat, canopy, okay? So the canopy means open the canopy um, and harness, tighten up your seat belts. Now, every time we, you execute one of those steps correctly, you get a little shot of endorphin. I'm doing a good job. And by the time you get that done, you're going, okay, I've done everything I can do. I know what's going to happen. And, and your, your performance, your vision's going to be wider and your performance is going to be better. So uh, I don't think that we should talk just about uh, engine failures after takeoff. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge that there are times when the best alternative, the only alternative, is safe. And the risk of an, uh, something unknown off of the end of the runway is better than the risk of a stall spin in the base to final turn. And in many cases, I, I would add that a good time to think about that is before you even begin the takeoff roll because you know what the terrain looks That's right. at the end of the runway and so, you don't need to make that decision right. only after something bad happens. You did a great video on pre-departure briefings. Um, at the home drone, everybody should know every piece of, of real estate in and around their airport that has several hundred feet or a few hundred feet of something that you can, can land on. Um, and you should just have that stuck away in the back of your mind that if I'm going this way, I know there's a patch over here. If, if the winds consider both directions to get into the wind, at your home airport until you get to an altitude where you know you're either away from humanity or something like that and if you make that decision before you leave the earth then you're not second guessing yourself and it's a hard and fast rule because you know another one if you compromise that rule and you start into that turn and you see it going south it's there's no way you can stop yourself from pulling back on the stick and pushing on the rudder pedal it's, you're just fighting against uh, your self-preservation and it's not treating you well. And, and again, once the airplane um, snaps to the inside, it's game over. Uh, if you've aerobatic training, if you've never done aerobatic training and go do a base to final tuck under uh, spin or snap roll, it is eye-opening. The airplane, if you've never experienced a slap roll, the airplane's just flying all at once in the flick, you know, the Brits call a snap roll a flick. And a, and a spin entry is essentially, a, a, a snap roll is a horizontal spin. And so a spin entry is essentially a low speed snap roll. And the airplane's just here and it's, and it's, and you're upside down and pointed straight at the ground. And it happens in a heartbeat. Let's talk about some other questions that, uh, that might come up in, in this situation, and one of them that's that's often discussed is I have a retractable be, retractable gear. I can't make it to any airport. I have a field in gliding distance that looks all right for a survivable landing. What do I do with the gear? In my world, the standard answer to that question is unless you're willing to bet your life on the quality of that surface, the default answer is gear up. The exceptions to that would be, again, going into the trees, okay? The gear would provide things to catch on tree limbs and so forth. Uh, number one, to slow you down as you proceed through the canopy, and number two, maybe hang you up in the canopy so you never make it to the ground. So if you're going into trees, I would, recommend, I would advocate for gear up or gear down. Uh, if you're going on to uh, pavement, I would uh, advocate for gear down. But if you're going into a uh, unknown surface, okay, then the default, I think, has to be um, gear up. And again, it goes back to, at that point, the airplane's job is to sacrifice itself for you. And we're going to sacrifice the airplane. And we want to slide, we don't want to flip. We want to end up on the belly and uh, and if you tricycle gear airplane, if you go into a soft field, the nose gear is going to collapse 
And when the nose gear collapses, the nose is going to go down, and chances are it's not going to plow along on its nose. It's going to continue over onto oh. its top. So uh, there are exceptions to that. You know, we're sitting here in Iowa with lots and lots and lots of beautiful farmland. And if it was an alfalfa field or a hay field, uh, I might be willing to take a risk that there's no foxhole in that. That's a reasonable risk, I think. Uh, you know, if I, I'm a farm kid, I know what different crops look like and what there might be. But unless you know how much, if it's uh, row crops that are cultivated, unless you know how much rain has been, you know, in the recent week, it could be a perfectly smooth field. But if it's wet, um, the soil type makes a difference. If it's sandy soil, it may work. If it's clay, muck, uh, the nose gear's gonna snap off and you're gonna end up on your top. Not that on your top is unsurvivable, but a, a, a gear up landing on the belly is gonna do a lot less damage to your airplane than a snapped off gear and flipping over on your top because that's a guaranteed total. And if you slide it in on the belly, you may very well uh, step out of the airplane and walk away sc unscratched. Another thing I see on check rides is, you know, we do a simulated engine failure, and people want to land way out in the middle of a section somewhere. You know, a section in Iowa is a one mile square. And so they pick a field and they're lined up for the middle of the section, and it might be in a cornfield that's 10 or 12 feet high. I always like to land or crash or do an airport, pick an off airport landing site that's close to humanity. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> while we typically don't teach primary students to land on roads, because if you encounter traffic or if you go off the road, lose a little bit of control and go off the road into the ditch, that can be really bad. But um, if the road is wide enough and acceptable enough, I might, I'm gonna pick a field that has a road next to it. Because if I crash next to the road, somebody's likely to see me and I might get some help. I might, need, I might have a broken ankle and unable to extricate myself from the airplane and the airplane might be on fire. And if I land next to the road and a good Samaritan jumps the fence and helps me out, that could make a big difference. Where if it's winter time and I land out in the middle of a section that's a half a mile from anything or farther, I could freeze to death before help gets there. So I always, you know, near a farmstead, near some civilization, near a road, at night, I like to follow interstates. You know, an interstate, you can land with the traffic. If you get down close to the traffic and uh, there's not an opportunity to land in the traffic, the ditches on interstates are very, very wide. The median on interstates, very, very wide. And just, you know, go for the road. And it's well lit. There's cars typically. So you've got some lighting. You can see what's going on there. You can see the lights disappear as they go in underneath a uh, a bridge so you know roughly yeah. where the crossing bridges are at. So if I'm uh, flying a single engine airplane at night, very often you'll see me, even on an IFR flight plan, I may ask for a 10 degree right to get within gliding distance of an interstate so I can follow, you know, Interstate 35 home from the south and, sure. uh, yeah. and stay over that interstate. Yeah. That's another, all of these are strategies that uh, discussions among peers can come up with ways to reduce that total risk and, and that's what really makes the difference. But unless we acknowledge the risk that engines quit, if you fly a single engine airplane, sooner or later, it will quit. Might not be in the period of time that you're flying it or owning it, but they, they all quit. We can do everything we can to try to make sure that doesn't happen, and we should, but as a pilot, we have a responsibility to be prepared for that when it does. So we've done all the homework possible to ensure the best possible outcome. I like the field next to a road option that you mentioned uh, for an additional reason. You know, a, a road, a nice paved road in the countryside could look pretty nice from altitude, but when you get closer, sometimes there are things that you didn't see from nice. 2,000 feet. Road in signs, I mean a road sign, you signs, hit a road sign. Telegraph the poles, ditch. things like that, fences. Crossing um, power lines. Power lines. So having a field next to it that on short final even you can divert to as um, A better as a way to think being. of it is plan for the field. And if you get down there and the road looks good, you can just sidestep yeah. to the road and take it. Uh, we have a moral responsibility not to put you know, others at risk right. on the ground. 
And so, uh, you know, if you get down there and there's an oncoming car, hey, they didn't sign up for this program. You know, we have a responsibility to, you know, sacrifice our, put it in the field and sacrifice our airplane. Mm -hmm. Well, a good discussion, Doc. I uh, think the main takeaways for me are, is, you know, know what your options are uh, and, and what, their, what their risks are. Uh, have an emergency check as the first steps memorized and, and, uh, and, and practiced in case the engine uh, fails and practice spot landings. And as you pointed out, you can do that free of charge on every flight. You don't need to hire an instructor. Uh, and that will really make a difference if one day you need that skill. Right. So in the en route phase, that's where our greatest exposure is. Um, and in the after takeoff phase, the, the turn back is a very high risk maneuver and it's an all or nothing bet. If it works, you're a hero, and if it fails, there's a funeral. You've got to have extremely high confidence before you begin that maneuver that, it, that you know absolutely and have practiced in the airplane that you're flying in the configuration that it's in that it's capable of performing that maneuver and it has to have some margin in it for the f that, it, that acknowledges uh, that we, as pilots under stress we don't fly as well as we do when we're uh, comfortable at four or five thousand feet above the airport. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really critical and I think um, a lot of the um, videos that we've seen on the internet of these leisurely turnbacks do a great disservice to really how difficult it is when it really happens. And, um, and, I, and I think we just need to be aware of that. And it's hard to comprehend just how, how reduced our abilities are and, and how, how we panic you know, if it, this hasn't happened to us before. Right, it's, uh, it's a reality. We, we, the, again, back to if we're unwilling to acknowledge the fact that our engine can quit and we're going to be called to deal called upon to deal with that at some point, then we need to really rethink what we're doing. And uh, if you fly single, you need to be able to deal with an engine failure. And if you fly a twin, you need to be able to deal with an engine failure. And both of them are have to be dealt with under a very high workload scenario. Uh, under stress and so we can't emphasize enough about how much uh, recurrent how important recurrent training is because I'll reiterate we do not rise to the level we do not rise to the occasion we sink to the level of our most recent recurrent training so that's the takeaway I would have thank you for the conversation Doug thank you and thank you for watching